Okay. We talked about the nervous system. We've talked about the sense organs. We've talked about a lot of different systems. Um, what we have to talk about now are diseases of the nervous system. This might make you a little uh, anxious. There are actually quite a few of them. Um, but a lot of this stuff you've actually heard of before. And so we're going to try to draw some connections uh, between those and what you know. So as you know, we can divide the nervous system into two primary divisions, central, brain and spinal cord, and peripheral, which is the cranial nerves and the peripheral nerves that connect the outside sensory world back to the brain. There are, uh, the functional cell of both of those symptoms systems is the neuron whose job is to transmit electrical impulses to and from the brain. If this, there is pathology anywhere within the transmission system, this results in an interruption of messages and clinical neurologic symptoms. The individual symptoms will vary depending on the location of the lesion. So our job as technicians, first of all, is to help the doctor um, with all the tests that we're going to be doing, but also to observe differences in what is normal, what is abnormal within the nervous system. All right, so remember, the brain. Uh, with the dog brain, obviously, they have very few functions. Um, chase cats, eat gar uh, garbage, a little bit of calculus, wake up the human, and bark. Um, but seriously, um, with the brain, uh, we can have trauma. Um, and whenever we talk about diseases, I'm going to remind you again, we're going to go through all of those different uh, possibilities. Is it immune mediated? Is it infectious? Is it inflammatory? Is it idiopathic? Is it due to trauma? Is it due to the endocrine system? Or is it due to neoplasia? So in this case, we're going to start with trauma of the brain. And in small animal medicine, traumatic brain injuries are encountered pretty frequently, unfortunately. Most of these injuries generally have an acute clinical onset, meaning it happened just now. Um, it results from a traumatic experience, like being hit by a car, having the head, uh, head closed within a door, falling, that kind of thing. Any injury to the brain from trauma can result from that direct injury to the nervous tissues, which is called the primary event, or from secondary events, which intensify or worsen the neurologic damage and produce systemic derangements. So these systemic or these sec secondary events um, often are due to um, inflammation or something that happens after the primary event. All right, so primary events produce uh, may produce disruption of fiber tracts, which cannot be repaired or um, reparable cell damage, um, which is for fortunately reversible. Now remember, if the neuron itself with where the nucleus is, is damaged or lost, we can't re repair that. But if it's the dendrite or the axon, axon, those branches off the neuron, we might be able to, to re uh, reverse that, repair that. That's why people that have nerve damage um, eventually can get some function back. Secondary events such as increased intracranial pressure or ICP, this is pressure because we're not getting normal flow of the cerebral spinal fluid through those cavities and through that space, it's being stopped somewhere. Um, uh, or if we have edema, hypoxia, loss of um, oxygen, seizures, all of those result, it can be occur as a result of the primary trauma. Increased intracranial pressure is caused by both edema and hemorrhage in or around the brain. And that's because the brain is encased in a non-flexible shell of bone, the skull, and herniation of t nervous tissue through that one little hole where, guess what, lives in that little tiny hole, the brain stem. Um, uh, it, it's right by that foramen, that little hole in, in, the, in the skull. And if we get herniation of that nervous tissue, that's the brainstem, that is deadly. It is immediately fatal. Treatment of head trauma involves preventing or decreasing that those secondary effects of trauma. We need to stop things like uh, intracranial pressure, edema, hypoxia, um, and seizures. So clinical signs of trauma, well, obviously we'll have history um, of trauma to the head. Seizures, blood in the ear, nose, or oral cavity, ocular hemorrhage, um, bleeding within the eye cavity, loss of consciousness or a decrease in response to external stimuli, meaning their cerebrum has been damaged, signs of shock, cardiac arrhythmias, altered respiratory patterns, and coma. Diagnosis is through history and physical examination. We can do serum chemistries to rule out any other metabolic 
problems. And then we need to do a uh, clinical rating uh, for the uh, prognosis of this trauma case. And your doctor is typically in charge of that. Uh, you will have experience with that, this, unfortunately. And uh, it will start to give you an idea of how animals will do following trauma. But remember, the brain is a tricky thing. And if we can correct any metabolic derangements treatment, provide oxygen through a mask or nasal cannula, elevate the head, and administer osmotic agents to decrease cerebral edema, if we can uh, change these secondary events, we can sometimes reverse uh, the damage. Let me talk about osmotic agents. Osmotic agents are large particles, large molecules. These are large molecules that are, if we give it in the, in the vessel, it will want to pull fluid into the vessel. So mannitol, diuretics like furosemide, um, those are two things, or well, mannitol is the osmotic agent, a diuretic is another um, uh, antidiuretic, or I'm sorry, is it, a diuretic is another agent that will pull water in, but mannitol does it as an osmotic agent. Let me say this though, if you give an osmotic agent to an animal that is bleeding into the head, actively bleeding into the head, then what you're doing is you're placing that osmotic agent into the blood vessel and it is leaking out of that blood vessel into the head and now you have an osmotic um, agent within the head that is then pulling further fluid into that head. So it will increase edema if you have bleeding, active bleeding into the head. So you want to be sure if you're going to um, administer this osmotic agent that you don't have any active bleeding into the head. We also may need to give anti-seizure medication if it's needed. And corticosteroids almost always are given, they help to stabilize membranes. Um, and in shock situations, um, giving a fast acting corticosteroid is, is very helpful. We need to tell the owner that some brain damage can be irreversible. If the animal survives, they sometimes never return to what they expect, not to normal. In general, animals in a coma for longer than 48 hours do not survive. And if we see deteriorating signs, then that tells us we're getting a worsening of the animal's condition. So it's not a, a, sign, a, a thing. Well, it may get better before it gets, get, or it may get worse before it gets better. If it gets worse, it's just going to continue to get worse. All right. Here's another um, uh, part of uh, the cause of certain uh, of diseases. Um, idiopathic. Remember, that means we don't know what causes it. Okay. So idiopathic vestibular disease is an acute disorder of both dogs, usually middle-aged dogs, and cats. In cats, the disease is usually seasonal. We most frequently see it during late spring, summer, and early fall, so during the light, lighter parts of the year. Clinical signs involve loss of balance, nystagmus, which is movement of the eye horizontally um, without movement of the head. You'll just see the eyes flickering. Disorientation and ataxia. Many animals experience nausea early in the course of the disease until their body kind of gets used to it. Animals will stabilize rapidly, so though it'll be very acute. Oh my gosh, they're very dizzy. They, they're they're um, not able to, to uh, know where the floor is in relation to where their feet are. The floor looks like it's tilting on them, um, but it's they stabilize, so the floor is always tilted in one direction, say. Um, and the clinical signs start to resolve um, on their own within three to six weeks. So generally, it's incapacitating. They can't move. They, the, the floor feels like it's completely tilted off kilter. They can't walk. Um, that night, nystagmus you'll see, disorientation, uh, ataxia, vomiting, and anorexia. They won't want to eat. Um, we diagnose it based on those clinical signs. We, we may want to do blood work to rule out any other diseases um, involving the nervous system. And obviously, we want to do an otic exam because we want to rule out an inner ear pro problem. So sometimes we have a completely clean outer ear, but in order to diagnose an inner ear problem, we have to do x-rays. So we want to look at that vestibular area to make sure that there's no inflammation and no infection going on in there. So idiopathic vestibular disease, uh, the treatment usually is not recommended. It does not alter the course of the disease. We just need to do some supportive therapy. So if they can't move, we want to be able to turn them frequently so they don't get um, ulcers on their skin. We want to be able to support them through force feeding if we need to. 
Um, steroids and antibiotics are usually used if we haven't found a cause, but we think there might be a possible cause. Um, we want to confine the animal to prevent injury from falling. Idiopathic epilepsy, again, we don't know what causes this. It's a syndrome that is characterized by repeated episodes of seizures for which there is no demonstrated cause. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. So we have to do a lot of tests to tell somebody that we don't know what the cause of this uh, disease is. We see it genetically in, in German Shepherds, miniature and toy poodles, St. Bernard's, Cocker Spaniels, Beagles, Irish Setters, Golden Retrievers, and some mixed breeds. Usually we will see it begin between one and three years of age, so they're relatively young. Affected animals may exhibit a short aura, um, which happens before they start to uh, seize, to actively seize, and they, they start to act a little bit abnormally. What they could do, they could hide or they could come find you. They may vo start to vocalize or just exhibit some other abnormal behaviors. Seizures are gen usually generalized, so their whole body will be involved and they last anywhere from one to two minutes. After the seizure, the animal is usually disoriented and occasionally blind. Seizures can occur singly or in clusters, and they may reoccur at fairly regular intervals. And in some animals, the stress or inciting events, excitement, asterisk, that kind of thing, can precipitate a seizure activity. Um, although we, we're pretty sure it's hereditary, uh, we don't really know what the cause is. So what is a seizure anyway? A seizure happens when you have nerve cells that um, react abnormally. So if they are stimulated, they continue to be stimulated and they kind of flow out and, and continue to stimulate the, the, um, uh, the, the nerve cells around them. So they, they are stimulated at a, at a rate that overwhelms that refractory uh, threshold. Uh, and they're constantly firing, constantly firing, constantly firing. What generally happens is that there is a focal area within the brain is called, called the seizure focus. And these are damaged nerve cells. They're not acting normally. And something stimulates them. It could be stress, could be excitement. Something stimulates them and they sort of go haywire. Okay. And so they cause cha neurologic changes throughout the body. Generally, what we see is they... Um, animals don't know that this is going on, so they, they are not um, aware. Their cerebrum kind of sh shuts down. They're unconscious in a way, um, but their eyes are open, and they start paddling. Their whole muscle system starts working. Um, they may lose control of their bladder or their um, col or their rectum, and so they may urinate and defecate. They often froth at the mouth as well. So depending on when, where the seizure focus is, will give you what, the, what they will be doing. Um, now, the problem is the more that they seizure, the more damage they do to the neurons. And the more damage they do to the neurons, the more likely they are to seizure. So once we have diagnosed a seizure um, episode, regardless of the cause, our goal then is to stop the seizures or, or reduce them as much as possible. So our clinical signs for idiopathic epilepsy, obviously seizures, and they occur at regular intervals, typically more than once every three months. Young animals are typically um, affected. Otherwise, they have normal behavior in between seizures. So again, we need to do a lot of um, blood work and tests in order to rule out other things. We're going to do a CBC, serum chemistries. We're going to want to rule out hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, infection, hepatic encephalopathy, lead poisoning. We want to rule out uh, head trauma or hydrocephalus if, we're, if we can do radiographs to do that, a CT scan or an MRI to rule out any space occupying lesions or masses within the brain. Treatment should be directed at the primary disease if we can find it. And if we can, obviously it's no longer idiopathic epilepsy. We want to initiate treatment if the seizure frequency is more than once per month. We want to control seizure activity typically with a drug called phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is a barbiturate and we use it two to three times a day depending on the animal. The drug takes a week to 10 days to reach a steady state serum concentration in the body. So it can take some time. Uh, the animal may experience seizures uh, during that time. If they experience seizures after this time, we need to measure that uh, phenobarbital concentration two hours before and after dosing. So we want to um, we want to see where that phenobarbital level. Now, typically, when we're testing phenobarbital, 
we want them to give a pill and then just before they're going to give the next pill, maybe 12 hours later, bring the animal in, let us take a blood sample and then give that pill. Um, that will help us to measure the lowest level of phenobarbital that is in the system, the trough level. And uh, if we see that it's below a certain level, so less than 20 micrograms per milliliter, which is the typical uh, dose that will control seizures, then we can increase the phenobarb. But if we have a low level and they're not having any seizures, there is no reason to increase the phenobarb. Whatever, is, uh, it, whatever it's doing, it's working for them. If the seizures occur and we have normal phenobarbital um, and adequate levels, we can also add something called potassium bromide. Potassium bromide is just a salt. We have to give it with food. It can cause some secondary side effects, but it is something that helps to stabilize um, the membranes within the nervous system and um, can help. Status epilepticus is when animals prone to seizures um, have a prolonged period of seizure, so greater than five to 10 minutes. And if they're in status epilepticus, we need to see them as soon as possible because if they continue to seize, it will lead to an irreversible coma and death if we don't treat it aggressively. So if, if a, we tell an owner to actually look at their watch when the seizure starts to happen, because 30 seconds can feel like 10 minutes. So we want them to actively look at their watch. If it goes on, if you're nearing five minutes and it's not slowing down, we want them in as soon as possible. Status epilepticus would be a prolonged uninterrupted seizure activity, and obviously we can diagnose it pretty easily. We want to immediately treat that animal with Valium, diazepam. We can give, I'll give you the dose here, but you don't really need that at the moment. Um, you should have this written out uh, near your crash cart at work uh, so that you're ready to give the proper dose immediately. Um, you can repeat it two to three times over several minutes, so it's a, you've got a pretty wide range and we can give it rectally, we can give it IV, um, and once we can get it in and once we get them steady enough to place an uh, IV catheter, we can actually give sodium pentobarbital to affect pentobarbital is euthanasia solution. We do have to watch the dose of euthanasia solution and make sure that we dilute it, um, but you wanna be very careful with it, but what we're trying to do is quiet all the activity in the brain. We want to make sure that we can establish an airway and give oxygen as needed. If they're seizing, they're using up all their oxygen, and we need to get oxygen to the brain. We want to place that IV catheter, start fluids. Again, if they're seizing, they're using up all their electrolytes and, and everything that they need. Uh, we want to have that vascular access to give medications. We want to check the blood glucose and calcium concentrations, um, give um, supplement if we need to. Um, we want to do a serum chemistry to rule out any other metabolic causes of the seizure and monitor the body temperature. Because their muscles are contracting so much, it will raise their body temperature, often above 105 degrees. I've seen it as high as 107. We want to cool, slowly cool them down. We can do it with a cool bath or a lukewarm bath. We can do it with alcohol rubbing on the pads um, of the feet. If they have been um, seizuring long enough, it will cause inflammation and edema in the brain. Um, blood will not be able to flow properly out of the brain, so that it will uh, push fluids into the brain, its uh, brain spaces. Um, we can give mannitol at this point. Remember what I said, as long as we don't have an active bleed, we can give mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic. It will help to, because it's a large molecule, it will help to pull fluid out of those spaces and back into the vascular system. Maintenance for status epilepticus, we can give them phenobarbital IV injectably, IV or IM every six hours. Um, and as soon as we can, we wanna start oral therapy. Epilepsy is incurable. Um, even with treatment, animals may still have seizures. Our goal is to decrease the frequency and the severity of the seizures. So we do want them to measure or um, time the seizures and make notes every time they have a seize. If we can spay or neuter the animal, that actually helps to prevent any hormonal influence on seizure activity. Medication will probably be required for the life of the pet, and missing a dose abruptly or, or abruptly stopping medication will precipitate a seizure. So we don't want them to just stop. We want them to have a con constant supply. In order to get a constant supply, we need to make sure that they are on a proper concentration, so we need to periodically monitor that. 
Most of these animals with seizures can live a fairly normal life, but again, we are going to need to monitor them and make sure. Animals that remain seizure-free for six to nine months, maybe they haven't had many seizures, we may re slowly reduce the medication dose and see if we can actually discontinue it, but we want to do that in consultation with a veterinarian. All right, another really cool, okay, maybe not cool, neurologic disease. This is called granulomatous meningoencephalitis. Now, if you can say this, I'll just go ahead and give you an A on this quiz. I'm just kidding. Um, this is also called pug dog encephalitis, but you can call granulomatous meningoencephalitis GME. It makes it a lot easier. Um, this is an, um, a CT scan of a dog, probably a pug dog based on the shape of the skull, um, with kind of a mushy brain. Okay, and that's uh, basically what happens. It's an inflammatory disease of the central nervous system of dogs, which uh, leads to focal or disseminated focal in one place or disseminated throughout. Granulomatous, granulomatous, remember what granulo, um, uh, granulomatous tissue, uh, granuloma formation of scar tissue. Okay, so it's an inflammatory thing. Um, so we get this disseminated granulomatous lesions within the brain and or spinal cord. This leads to a non-suppurative, which means it's um, not pussy. You don't, you don't have a lot of um, fluid exudate. It's a non-suppurative meningitis and perivascular mononuclear coughing. What does that mean? That means all the way around, all the vessels that are supplying the brain, we have this buildup of um, uh, mononuclear cells, white cells. Um, cuffing around those blood vessels, which significantly decreases the amount of nutrition and oxygen that can go through these vessels and into the brain tissue. Superative would be filled with pus, and it's more typical of a bacterial meningitis, not GME. So um, if we were able to get a sample of this um, and look under a microscope, we would see with GME uh, we wouldn't see a lot of purulent exudate, lots of neutrophils, okay? Lots of neutrophils mean we have lots of pus. Um, with non-suppurative, we'll just see a lot of other white cells. There's an unknown known cause to this. It could be infectious, immune-mediated, could be in relation to the distemper vaccine or a vaccine contaminant. Um, there's no there's no actual research that tells us what is causing it. Could be pyrocytic, toxoplasma might be causing it. Could be drug related, could be levamisole is a drug that could be causing it. Viral, um, a virus could cause it, could be new plastic. We don't know what causes it. All of these things could cause it. It's simply the body's reaction to it. It occurs in young adult, small breed dogs. And again, pugs are um, widely, unfortunately, represented in this um, disease. Symptoms reflect the area of CNS which is affected and can range from seizures to behavioral changes to coma or paralysis. And I will say that some seizures, based on where that focus is, that uh, seizure focus is, can simply be behavioral changes. We can have animals with aggressive seizures, which is really interesting. Seizures can also be what we call petite mal or small seizures, where animals are just fly biting or just biting at the air. And that's a, that's a small seizure. So seizures can be really interesting just because they're within the brain. Diagnosis for GME is involved um, based on ruling out other causes of meningitis, but will likely involve an MRI or biopsy. Remember, what we're looking for is a non-superative meningitis. Treatment is um, corticosteroid treatment. We're, we need to suppress the immune system to stop it from attacking the brain. And we taper that over several months, not weeks. Prognosis is generally pretty poor. <clears throat> All right, uh, that was a, um, a repeat uh, slide here. So we'll move on to neoplasia. Neoplasia is an enlarging tumor within the brain that produces tissue compression and or replaces healthy neuronal tissue, causing clinical signs that are progressive. Primary brain tumors are typically singular, but metastatic tumors or secondary brain tumors may be solitary or multiple in occurrence. Most tumors are metastatic by the time the animal is examined. And it's a disease typically seen in older animals. So when we hear of an older animal showing neurologic signs that um, indicate that the location of the lesion is within the brain, we think cancer. 
clinical signs reflect where the tumor is. Could be seizures, which increase in frequency and severity. Could be uh, cause endocrine derangements. Remember the hypothalamus and the pituitary is there. Could be a presence or absence of vestibular sign. Could be um, tremor or an ataxia. Diagnosis, um, we do a systematic screening for primary tumors in other organs. We want to look for it throughout the body. Remember, we're pretty sure it's already metastasized. We do blood work, and we want to look at a CBC and serum chemistries. Radiographs, cerebral spinal fluid tap um, will show increased pressure because there's a mass in the head, increased albumin, which is a part of protein uh, within the blood, and usually a normal white blood cell count. So if we were to see a meningitis or a viral um, problem or an, a bacterial problem, we'll see an increased white blood cell count. Um, but with neoplasia, it's normal, typically normal. Um, an ophthalmic examination may indicate that we have edema around the optic disc, that optic nerve edema. Remember I said that when you look within the eye, you're actually getting a good look at the nervous system. We can do a CT scan or an MRI. That's the best way of showing us where the lesion is. Treatment, surgical removal, if we have a superficial singular lesion on the outside of the brain, um, newer techniques can make deeper removal a possibility in the future. Using radiation can help. Chemotherapy, if it's a lymphoma, it will respond fairly well. Others, it's not as uh, responsive. We can treat the clinical signs um, somewhat palliatively. Um, just limit the seizures with phenobarbital, um, give them uh, corticosteroids to limit the edema and the inflammation. So unless the tumor can be removed surgically, medication will not cure the condition. Symptoms will gradually become more severe as the tumor grows inside. Moving on to the spinal cord. Just like the brain, the spinal cord is protected by a bony housing the vertebral column. That spinal cord is located within the spinal canal, which is dorsal to those vertebral bodies. Between each of those vertebral bodies is a cushion that's known as the intervertebral disc. These discs are composed of an outer fibrous layer, and the, uh, the, which is called the annulus fibrosis, and then an inner gel-like nucleus, the nucleus pulposus. And you're asking me, why am I telling you about the anatomy of the spinal column. Isn't that part of the skeleton? Yes, it is. But because we have these discs in between the bone and we have a spinal canal that goes from bone to bone to bone with a little space in between where that disc is, but the disc is just below that, that disc can rupture into the spinal canal and cause problems. So the, it's the presence of this disc that allows us to move our vertebral column and prevent the vertebral bodies from rubbing up against each other. So we need the discs, but we also need to protect those discs. So this is what it looks like here is a vertebral body, vertebral body. Here's the disc in between with the annulus uh, fibrosis and the nucleus uh, pulposus in the center. It's kind of like a, uh, a Jolly Rancher with a gel center. By far, one of the most common disorders involving the spinal cord of small animals is the intervertebral disc disease. Disc protrusions can occur in all breeds of dogs and occasionally in cats. And it has been reported that 75 to 100% of all discs in chondrodystrophic breeds, these are short uh, breeds that have bred, been bred to have shorter than normal uh, torsos or legs, and that includes the dachshund, Bulldog, Corgi, Pug, French Bulldog, Basset Hound, Pekingese, Lhasa Apso, Shih Tzu, Beagle, and Minshur Toy Poodle. These chondrodystrophic breeds, chondro means cartilage, dystrophic means um, abnormal growth. Um, they have undergone degenerative changes by one year of age. So 75 to 100% of all the discs in these breeds are already undergone degenerative changes by one year of age. That's unbelievable what we have done to these breeds. Disc protrusion or extrusion occurs most commonly in the cervical or neck region, the caudal thoracic, and the lumbar spine. Two types of herniations have been reported, only two that you have to remember. Type 1 is common in younger dogs. It involves an acute rupture of the annulus fibrosis, that outer covering, an extrusion, extrusion of that nucleus pulposus up into the spinal canal. Take a Twinkie and squeeze it. You squeeze it hard enough, 
that inner filling comes rupturing out, okay? So that's common in younger dogs. Type 2 herniation is common in older, greater than 5 years old, large breed dogs. And the extrusion occurs over a longer period of time. It happens slowly. It produces less acute, less severe clinical signs. They get used to it. Oh, my back kind of hurts today. It's a little bit worse today, but I can get used to it. Um, and that's a type 2. The severity of the spinal cord injury depends on the speed at which the disc material is deposited into the spinal canal, the degree of compression of the spinal canal, and the duration of compression of the spinal canal. So either one of these can lead to paralysis because it depends on speed and overall compression. And the com clinical signs of each of these will be related to the location of the lesion. So that's why it's important for us to understand reflexes. And when reflexes are hyporeflexive, we know that it is a, is a lesion that occurs cranial, a couple of vertebrae cranial, to where that reflex comes out of the spinal canal. If we have no reflex or more of a reflex, that, uh, I'm sorry, more of a reflex means it's cranial to that reflex where, the, where it comes out of the spinal canal. No reflex or less reflex than normal means it's occurring right where that um, nerve root comes out of the spinal canal and affects that reflex. So knowing that gives us the location of the intervertebral disc disease. Here's the nucleus propulsus um, being squeezed out of our th little Twinkie. Um, the faster it goes, the harder it hits, the more damage it does. Clinical si signs, there is apparent pain and the presence or absence of motor and sensory deficits. They can feel it or they can't feel it, or they can move it or not move it. That can kind of tell us where it is. It's um, acute onset in type 1, can seem like acute onset in type 2 if they've been doing fine, doing fine, doing fine, and all of a sudden it's moved just enough to compress um, more than half of the spinal cord, and now they can't walk at all. So paresis or par paralysis and could be unilateral or bilateral, depending on what part of the spinal canal is affected. We will get a decreased paniculus reflex. And what is a paniculus reflex? It's when we pinch the skin and the skin twitches. And we will get it decreased. You'll get normal, normal, normal. And then all of a sudden it will stop one to two vertebral spe spaces caudal to the actual lesion. So we find where it stops and we go up to the spine, count two vertebrae up. That's where you're going to find the lesion. We'll also get an altered deep pain response. So you a deep pain is when you squeeze really hard on the toe and they respond to it. Diagnosis is based on age, breed, clinical signs and history, complete neurologic exam. We'll go over that uh, while we're in class. Radiographs require anesthesia for proper positioning. We have to be very careful that we don't make the lesion worse. We're going to see a narrowed disc space. Remember, we're looking for changes in the spaces um, because we can see the bones really well, not the discs. Narrowed disc space uh, will be seen, and usually, like I said, in the cervical region or the lower thoracic um, and lumbar region. And we'll um, there are normal places along the spine at C7 to T1, at T9 to T10, L7 and S1 that normally look more narrow than, norm, than, than you would expect. They just have smaller discs normally. In order to get a definitive location of the lesion, we need to do what's called a myelogram. And that includes injecting contrast material into the cerebral spinal fluid uh, and looking at it um, through an x-ray and watching where it flows up instead of straight across. Treatment for type 1. Medical treatment is recommended for animals with pain, so if they can feel pain, that's good, with or without mild neurologic deficits. Strict confinement for a minimum of two weeks, so they're in a cage only, and they can walk carefully outside, not up or down steps, but carefully outside to go potty and right back inside again. Corticosteroids is injected for one to two days to decrease the edema and the inflammation, and they need intensive nursing care. These animals require soft padding in the cage. They may need indwelling urinary catheters or expression of the bladder. They may need to be turned frequently to prevent pressure sores, and all animals should receive proper nutrition to promote healing. 
surgical treatment should be reserved for animals with multiple episodes, or if they have ataxia, paresis or paralysis, absence of deep pain, that's a big one. If we don't have deep pain, we have a problem. We can do something called a fenestration, which is opening a space for that um, that uh, disc to, to be so that we don't, um, we don't have any pressure upwards on the spine. Hemilaminectomy means we're removing a portion of the um, vertebral column in order to remove a portion of the disc. Decompression um, is what we do. Um, we call all of this, and we need to perform that as soon as we possibly can to prevent further damage to the spinal cord. I don't know if you remember from intro class, but I did discuss there is something that works better than surgery and is a part, it's not really medicine, it's alternative medicine, and it's um, acupuncture. Acupuncture has a very high rate of success as long as we have deep pain, as long as there is a connected piece of spine of nervous tissue, then, then uh, um, acupuncture works pretty well. Type 2 treatment, because it's a slow progression of spinal compression um, and degeneration of the spinal tissue, dogs may improve initially with uh, steroid therapy, but surgery um, sometimes fails because it's been such a long time to improve. It, it will fail to improve spinal function. So information for clients. We want to make sure that these breeds that are prone to disc disease stay skinny. We want to prevent excess weight gain. The more weight they have on, within their abdomen strains the back. We also want these animals to avoid standing on their hind legs or any other position that strains their back. We don't want them jumping up on couches, the beds, that kind of thing. Prognosis for animals that lack deep pain for greater than 24 hours is poor. If they lack deep pain for less than 24 hours, they have a guarded to poor prognosis. So lacking deep pain at all is not good. Prognosis for animals that have or regain deep pain after surgery is fair to good. Approximately 40% of animals treated medically had a recurrence of disease with more severe signs. So um, even though we treat it medically, um, it will recur. Animals with paresis or paralysis require intensive nursing care, and they may need exen extensive home care as well while they're re uh, recovering. Severe damage to the spinal cord is currently not reparable, but someday, maybe so. Acute spinal uh, cord injuries of the dog and cat usually results from motor vehicle accidents, gunshot wounds, or fights, um, especially a big dog on a little animal. Um, spinal cord trauma is sudden in onset and may be related um, to the velocity of cord compression, the degree of compression, and the duration of the cord compressive force. Signs of injury are typically non-progressive, so they're bad and they don't get any worse. Um, but they could worsen a little bit at first. If it's a spinal cord injury um, over the fir first 48 hours before we can stabilize, um, the, the swelling and the edema could progress a little bit. Injury can occur at single or multiple levels within the spinal cord. Blunt trauma to the spinal cord causes tissue injury through both direct and indirect mechanisms. And this can actually occur in the brain as well. We have the direct effect, which are the, due to the primary disruption of the neural pathways within the cord. And then the indirect effects like the secondary effects within the brain, um, they're a little less well understood, but they have uh, they include edema, hemorrhage, ischemia, which is loss of blood flow to that area, lactic acidosis when we don't have enough oxygen and we get uh, damage to the tissue through the lactic acid, inflammation, and neuronophagia by white cells. So the white cells go, oh, those neurons look funny because they've been damaged. I'm going to eat them up. That's not a good thing. It appears that the mechanical deformation of any type can trigger any of these secondary events within the spinal cord, and uh, we can get auto-dissolution of the cord. The cord gets eaten up by the white blood cells as early as 24 hours after the injury. Clinical signs of spinal cord trauma, history of the trauma. Uh, affected animals have serious injury, usually to other organ systems. If we have the presence of schiff sherrington sign, which means we have rigid front legs, you can see this dog down here, very rigid front legs. These back legs um, are hypotonic and, and they're very flaccid. Um, we, can't, we, can't, we can move them any which way, there's no muscle tone. Um, if they have normal reflex, uh, they could have uh, normal reflexes and pain perception um, and, uh, caused by the release of inhibitory uh, pathways along the spinal cord. Um, from L1 to L7. 
Um, any la if we have a lack of paniculus uh, reflex caught of the lesion, that'll tell us where the lesion is. Um, any um, paresis or paralysis. The Schiff Sherrington sign is bad news. Um, that means we have almost complete severance of the spinal column. Diagnosis, obviously, we want to do a complete neurologic exam. We want to localize the lesion. Where is this red line? Um, do x-rays. X-rays can really show us where it is. We have to be very, very careful, especially when we're doing x-rays, not to do any more damage. We've got to keep that spinal column as uh, rigid as possible. Remember that the vertebral column can return to a normal position after trauma. So even if they've been hit, we've got a um, severed vertebral column, it can go back to normal. It will look normal and will hide that original compressive event. A myelogram uh, may be necessary to locate the actual site of the cord injury. Medical treatment, corticosteroids. Um, giving a short, act, quick acting um, uh, corticosteroid, it's short, also short acting. We can give mannitol to reduce edema. Dimethyl sulfoxide or DMSO, we can give that IV and that also will reduce edema. We need to treat other life-threatening injuries with IV fluids, oxygen, monitor heart rhythms and urine production. And we need strict confinement for six to eight weeks if we have mild fractures or dislocations. If they have few clinical signs, they might, might, might make it. If not, um, <clears throat> we may need to do surgical treatment. We need to do treatment within two hours of the trauma if we can. Surgical treatment should be considered in cases of severe paresis or paralysis, just like disc disease, myelographic evidence of continuing cord compression, or worsening of clinical signs. A laminectomy, just like um, intervertebral disc disease, should be performed at all sites of cord compression. Stabilization of the vertebral column fractures or subluxations um, must be performed. Removal of all bone fragments or disc material from the spinal canal has to be uh, done as well. There's something called a durotomy. If you remember what the dur dura matter is, uh, that is the outer covering of the nervous tissue. We can take a little window out of that and relieve the, the pressure on the cord. Complete confinement for a minimum of two weeks after surgery, which means they are urinating and defecating in the kennel. Nursing care. Daily, daily physical therapy. We need them on a padded resting surface and we need to turn them carefully to decrease the formation of ulcers over pressure points. Bladder expression may be needed or we want to put an indwelling catheter in. When they lose control of the bladder, we need to figure out how we're going to uh, maintain that. We need to tell clients that treatment of these cases is often costly and requires referral to a specialist. The animal will require extensive nursing care. Even in the best of circumstances, some residual neurologic def deficit can remain. The prognosis for spinal cord trauma will depend on the neurologic examination results. Worsening of any of these clinical signs is another indicator of poor outcome, but remember it can get worse and spinal cord trauma can get worse for 48 hours before it gets better. Recovery time can extend to months in some of these cases. We need to keep, in order to prevent this, keep pets combined or on a leash to avoid the possibility of a traumatic injury to the spinal cord. So don't let them go running into traffic. All right, there are some cervical spinal cord diseases that are um, uh, we can find in certain breeds uh, and for certain size animals. This atlantoaxial subluxation, this is seen most frequently in young, less than one year old, toy and miniature breeds of dogs, and occasionally in other breeds. Um, spinal cord trauma occurs when the cranial portion of the axis, which is uh, the second vertebrae, cervical vertebrae, is displaced into the spinal column. So normally there is a dens that fits and stops the flexion, the overflexion of that joint. Um, when it displaces into the spinal uh, canal, obviously we're going to have some problems. And that can occur because of congenital or developmental abnormalities, trauma, or even a combination of both of those. There is speculation that there is a mechanism that is similar to the femoral head necrosis. Um, remember leg calf perthes disease that is seen in, in some of these breeds. 
Prognosis is fair to good for animals with mild signs, but we don't want to use these animals for breeding because this condition may be hereditary. With these animals, they don't like to be patted on the head. They'll actually scream in pain, literally scream in pain. They'll have neck pain when they move their head. There may be paresis or weakness of the limbs, tetra, um, because it's so far up on the um, spinal cord, it will affect all four limbs, or tetraplegia, so um, weakness or complete loss of uh, all four limbs. Sudden death due to respiratory paralysis. This is right up there by the uh, brain stem, so any damage there can uh, cause respiratory paralysis. Um, to diagnose it, we need to do radiographs, so we have to be very careful when we put uh, position it to do just a slight ventriflexion. And uh, we want to be very careful not to use a lot of sedatives or anesthesia, even though they might be painful, because that decrease in muscle tone, um, when you're obtaining the radiographs and doing that ventriflexion, you could actually push that dens right up into the spinal cord and cause a problem. So you want to avoid further spinal cord damage when you position the animal. Um, there may be other congenital abnormalities of that cervical vertebrae, so you need to look for those. To treat it, we can splint the neck in extension and put them in a cage for six weeks. Not fun, but it can help. Uh, we can treat uh, same as other spinal cord traumas as well. So there's surgical stabilization. We can do um, stabilize that area, decompress it, or do both if it's necessary. Um, if they have especially neurologic deficits or neck pain, we can go dorsally, and I've described the surgery here, but honestly, you don't really need to know uh, about it. I've just described it for your information. Dorsally, there's a stainless steel wi wire that's um, attached and uh, between the axis and the art uh, uh, atlas to keep it from moving too far out of position. You can go ventrally. You can actually fuse those vertebrae together. You can also do a hemilaminectomy. The other neck disease, cervical spondylomyelopathy, is called wobbler syndrome. And this happens at C5, C7, not C1, C2, but C5, C7 at the lower end of the neck. And it is a spinal cord compression that results um, as a malformation or misarticulation. This occurs most often in large breed dogs and predominantly in male Great Danes and Doberman Pinschers. We will see clinical signs at uh, before or at one year of age in the Great Dane, Dane and about two years of age in the Doberman. Signs are normally progressive and involve hind limb ataxia, a wobbly gait, and it starts with hind limb and it gradually moves forward. So it's a malformation between C5 and C7. Here's our vertical instability here, pressing up on the spinal cord. This is a myelogram. Pelvic limbs may cross each other. They may abduct wildly, so be um, spread, uh, spread legged, or they could collapse. Animal may drag its toes, so they don't have a good conscious proprioception, um, and that will produce abrasions on the dorsal surface or wearing of those tail, uh, nails dorsally. Proprioception will be abnormal. Um, some animals will have similar lesions in the thoracic limbs, um, especially if um, uh, it's affecting a little bit further up on the cervical vertebrae. Uh, neurologic examinations will be abnormal when we're testing um, their posture, postural reactions, hopping, and proprioception. So here's a diagram of what it looks like. It's a malformation that causes compression of the spinal cord called wobbler's disease. Great Dane with wobbler's disease. He's got a neck brace on to try to keep everything straight. I will tell you, it doesn't always work really well. Um, and here is a um, uh, Doberman. Looks as if we have some pain. Um, we've got a lower hunched appearance, and our legs are spread apart here, and it, it's affecting these thoracic limbs as well. Clinical signs, history of progressive pelvic limb ataxia, abnormal wearing of the dorsal surface of the rear paws, nails or both, a swinging or wobbly gait in the rear limbs. That's why it's called wobbler syndrome. The gait is worse when they first get up. Um, similar signs can start in the front limbs. We can have a presence or absence of atrophy, so we may or may not have atrophy of the scapular muscles, rigid flexion of the neck without neck pain. So it's very guarded. Uh, they have a very guarded appearance. Um, we want to do CBC and serum chemistries. So we need to rule out hypothyroidism and other metabolic defects that can also cause neurologic conditions. 
Um, radiographs can indicate malalignment or a slipping of the vertebrae, can indicate remodeling or new bone formation and a narrowing of the spinal canal. But the myelography, the myogram, is the best way to look at those regions of compression. CT and MRI are great if we can do them. Treatment, without treatment, the prognosis is poor. Um, medically, we can do an anti-inflammatory dose of cortisone. We can try a neck brace um, and cage confinement. Overall, the prognosis for these dogs is guarded. Um, it's most likely hereditary. Dogs have multiple levels of compression with a less favorable, um, will have a less favorable prognosis than those with the one level of compression, just one uh, disc is um, um, affected. Surgery is risky and costly, and some animals may experience development of other areas of compression after surgery. Degenerative myelopathy. This is a disease that are com is commonly seen in German Shepherds and German Shepherd mixed breed dogs. We can also see it in Collies, Siberian Huskies, Labs, and Kerry Blue Terriers. We think there is a genetic basis, but we don't really have evidence for that. Um, it could uh, result actually from an autoimmune response to an antigen in the nervous system. So the um, immune system is attacking the animal's own uh, nervous system. What we see, the lesion, is a diffuse degeneration of white matter in the, both the ascending and descending tracts of all segment, segments of the spinal cord. So basically, we have degeneration of white matter. The lesion is most extensive in the thoracic region. The affected dog is usually older, greater than five years, and has a five to six month history of progressive ataxia and paresis, weakness in the rear limbs. Think of those German shepherds, older German shepherds that you see just sinking down in those rear legs and being a little bit drunk as they walk uh, with the rear legs. The first thing we see is a loss of proprioception. Owners will often report that the animal will fall down when it's attempting to defecate. They just don't have the balance in the rear legs to support the squat. Um, there may be muscle wasting from disuse in the caudal, thoracic, and lumbosacral areas so along the spine and symptoms slowly progress until the animal is unable to support weight with the rear limbs. So we see a slowly progressive hind limb paresis and ataxia with muscle atrophy. Radiographs may show some ossification of the dura, so the, the lining of the spinal cord, or narrow disc spaces, but usually are normal. Cerebrospinal fluid, um, if we do a uh, CSF tap, we will find increased protein concentrations in that uh, lumbar area, the subarachnoid space in the lumbar area. Um, neurologic examination will tell us that there's a lesion in the region of T3 to L3, so uh, somewhere in that region. Decreased or absent proprioception, placing reactions, um, increased to normal patellar reflexes. Remember, if the lesion is uh, cranial to the patellar reflexes, which come out of the, the lumbar region, so um, if it's before uh, L1, L3, uh, then we will have hyperreflexia. Um, lack of pain, a dorsal sphincter tone, or normal sphincter tone, sorry, and a normal paniculus reflex. So all of this is normal, but we have decreased CPs and, decre and increased reflexes. There's no treatment for this disease. The symptoms will progress. Uh, corticosteroids don't improve the symptoms. Some things will um, slow progression. Vitamin E and other antioxidants can help uh, boost um, the, the health of the nervous tissue. Um, so it is degenerative myelopathy. It's progressive. It's incurable. It's not hip dysplasia. It's an irreversible degeneration of the spinal nerves. And as soon as the dog can no longer support their weight, it's time to consider euthanasia. Discospondylitis or vertebral osteomyelitis is when a bacteria or fungi become implanted in the bones of the vertebral column. And this implantation can come through hemat hematogenous roots, through the bloodstream, from penetrating wounds, paravertebral, um, on either side of the verte uh, vertebral column, abscess or infection, surgery on the vertebral column, or migrating grass Um These are uh, seed packets that are in grasses that uh, can, get to, can get into the skin or into the ear or into the nose and migrate through the body. Grass-ons, the sharp pieces of the plant material, um, can, can migrate all the way through the skin into the spinal bone, cause infections. Really crazy. 
Um, discospondylitis is seen both the dog and the cat. Large and giant breeds are more commonly affected. And what you'll see is this big bridging of bone between the two vertebral columns. And this bridging can cause some decrease in the movement of the vertebral column, so it can cause some pain there. But the biggest pain uh, that we see is when we have a fracture of this fragile bone here and we have inflammation into the spinal canal. Hematogenous spread is most likely the common is probably the most common cause of discospondylitis. Um, urinary tract infections, bacterial endocarditis, and sites of uh, dental extraction can also be roots uh, for this bacterial infection. Organisms that we culture from these areas include Brucella, Brucellosis, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, E. coli, Cyanobacterium, Proteus, um, Pasteurella species, and then uh, Aspergillus, which is a fungus and mycobacterium. Clinical signs, we'll see weight loss. It's a chronic disease, um, it hurts. Um, fever of unknown origin, depression, reluctance to exercise, spinal pain, hyperesthesia, so it'll be very painful when you pay, press over the spine. And then we may or may not have uh, neurologic signs, but we, we put this in the neuro um, section. Radiographs can show destruction or lysis of uh, bony end plates adjacent to the lesions, osteophyte formation, which is that big bridging um, that, that I showed you, and collapse of that intervertebral disc space. A complete blood count may show increased white blood cell count. The CSF may be normal or could have increased protein in white blood cells. A myelography will demonstrate areas of uh, spinal compression. We will want to do aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal cultures of the blood, the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and the urine. We also want to do a bru uh, brucella canis slide agglutination test. Um, to test for brucellosis, that is a zoonotic disease. Um, in order to um, really test it though, if we can do a surgical biopsy and tissue culture, that is diagnostic. Treatment would be a long-term antibiotic therapy based on what our culture and sensitivity tell, tells us. So something that can penetrate the bone would be um, classes of antibiotics like cephalosporins, clindamycin, or enrofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone and chloramphenicol. Um, this ha this will um, treatment can be anywhere from six weeks to six months. If they are positive for brucellosis, we need to neuter or spay the animal. Um, we can um, and brucellosis uh, infection is treated with different antibiotics, streptomycin and uh, tetracycline. Um, if discospinolitis is there, we need to remember that brucellosis can be infectious to humans. So we do want to be very careful when we're handling bodily fluids and uh, any aborted tissue, um, we want to um, test them for this as well and warn their owners. Animals with discospinulitis are painful because it's an inflammation, infection right in those uh, areas of the spine. So we want to give them um, analgesics and be very careful when we're handling. Of course, always be, be aware of brucellosis. Um, make sure we let the uh, owner know that it is contagious to humans through urine or any, if, if they have aborted fetal fluids or tissue, uh, we wanna uh, be very careful with that. Prognosis is guarded. Um, the treatment is costly and it's long-term, and we'll have to do reevaluation of radiographs every two to three weeks to make sure we're following up with the treatment. Now, osteospondylitis is very different from discospondylosis, and this is something we frequently see. It's non-inflammatory degeneration of the vertebral column. This is spondylosis deformans, and it's present in a dog having no clinical signs. There's a so we'll we'll see this dog for other things, and we'll take an X-ray, and we'll see this this bridging. Now this bridging is not as severe. Well, this is pretty severe here. It's all the way across. This is bridging that has broken. This is bridging that has broken, but it doesn't seem to be as active um, as mothing really as the other stuff. Um, these ankylosing bridges, there's one starting here as well, um, keep those that vertebrae from, from moving as freely. And we typically will only see pain in this an animal when we see a fracture of this site. An ischemic myelopathy caused by a fibrocartilaginous embolism. Um, an ischemic myelopathy means we have uh, decreased blood flow to the nervous tissue, and it can be caused by a clot, a fibrocartilaginous embolism. And it occurs in large and giant breed dogs anywhere between the ages of one to nine. 
It's also been reported in cats and smaller breeds of dogs, but less frequently. Ischemic myelopathy results from necrosis of the spinal cord, gray and white fiber tracts when a fibrocartilaginous amylite or clot obstructs the veins and arteries in both the leptomeninges and the cord parenchyma. We don't know what causes this embolus. Okay, so anything could cause the embolus, but what the, the result is, is that it stops the blood flow and kills the tissue of the spinal cord. Affected dogs may have a history of mild to moderate exercise just before they develop the clinical signs. So they've developed a clot, they don't know they have a clot, they get their blood flow moving and all of a sudden the blood flow stops. The onset of symptoms is always acute and the neurologic deficit is could be severe depending on where the location is. Symptoms first may appear progressive but usually stabilize after first 12 hours. Deficits are usually bilateral, so on either side, and but could be asymmetric, so worse on one side than the other. Horner syndrome can be seen if we have a cervical spine, um, the movement and uh, sensation of the face. An embolism in the lumbosacral spinal cord usually produces lower motor neuron signs in the rear limbs, the anal and urinary sphincters, and the tail. Clinical signs are usually seen in large and giant breed dogs that are predisposed to this condition. Um, acute onset of neurologic signs. There's going to be a lack of acute spinal pain associated with this neurologic sign, so it's not like intervertebral disc disease. They're not super painful, but they will have paresis or spastic paralysis of the limbs. They will be reluctant to move and unable to, una sometimes unable to rise because there's just no blood flow there. We need to rule out every other cause of myelopathy, so we have to rule out IVDD and GME and all sorts of things. Um, radiographs are usually normal, CBC is normal, CSF is normal, myelogram may show mild edema if the cord, of the cord if it's uh, up to 24 hours after the injury. After that, we may see nothing. Treatment is corticosteroids, and I, I have to be honest that um, most vets are pretty good at diagnosing this. It's an old, usually an older dog, um, all of a sudden is down, and what do we do? We give them a shot of corticosteroids, and we give them the same dose as spinal shock. We then um, provide good nursing care, and very often they will recover almost completely within a few months. And within a few days, usually they're up and moving about. So it really depends on how much damage has occurred. So it could, the prognosis could be guarded to good. Most animals will recover, but can, it can take up to several months to gain total normal function. Function during that time, it may be necessary to provide extensive nursing care um, to keep them um, comfortable and prevent further injury. So that was the central nervous system and diseases of the central nervous system. I'm going to give you a break, make you take a break. We're going to come back with part two on the peripheral nervous system in just a moment.